A tenet of a pluralistic democracy is the existence of more than one political party and where elections are considered to be free and fair. In such a system, both parties have at least, in theory, an equal opportunity to win elections. Even in democracies, there will always be a, quote, natural party of government. In other words, a political party that voters will gravitate towards for various reasons, be it political reasons, economic, or cultural reasons. Even in a free and open political system, one party will always have more appeal and therefore more resources to win elections than other political parties. Keep in mind, this is very different from systems like China or the former Soviet Union, where only one party could win because no other parties were legally allowed to exist. In this series, I'm going to explore the political parties, both past and present, that almost always won, even when the system that they resided in was fair and balanced. In researching this, I thought about Western Canada and its politics, which was dominated by the Social Credit Party. Social credit was a monetary and then later a political theory devised by Major C.H. Douglas. Douglas was a British soldier turned engineer who theorized that the cause of economic downturns was the result of deficiencies between the cost of goods and the composition of the workers who created such goods. To enhance the purchasing power of people and businesses, Douglas proposed that the government should give out debt-free banknotes known as social credit to the population. As well as being a monetary movement, it was also a political movement that opposed ballot box democracy. It had similarities with technocracy incorporated in the United States, which proposed that politicians should be banned and instead government should be governed by experts. Douglas's ideas were appealing during the traumatic times of the Great Depression that had hit Canada especially hard. The first government to be created that was based upon the ideas of Douglas was in the province of Alberta. In 1932, William Aberhart popularized the movement. Aberhart was a evangelical pastor who brought a religious bent to the social credit movement. His charisma and religious zeal won over followers to the movement. In 1935, Aberhart led the Alberta Social Credit Party to a surprise victory in the Alberta provincial elections. This would be the first social credit government in the world. Once in power, Aberhart began to implement what he called prosperity dividends to the population in accordance to Douglas's prescriptions. It didn't last long though, as there would end up being a revolt by his backbenchers. Soon afterwards, Aberhart would abandon most social credit policies and embrace social conservatism and economic liberalism. This would become a running theme within the regional and later federal social credit parties and movement. West of Alberta and British Columbia, the movement was more fractional. In the 1945 British Columbian elections, a loose alliance of social credit parties emerged and put up 16 candidates for the legislature. In 1949, the alliance broke down. However, 14,000 votes were cast in favor of candidates who supported social credit policies. 
the British Columbian Social Credit Party really would not come into its own as a force till the 1952 elections. That year, a coalition government composed of liberals and conservatives had changed the voting system to preferential voting. The rationale behind this was to prevent the, the left-wing cooperative federation from seizing power. The coalition had hoped that there would be enough voters in the provinces that would choose either the liberal or Tory candidate as their first or second preference. The plan backfired in the worst possible way for the coalition. Voters were dissatisfied with the coalition, and many of would-be supporters would go on to vote for the Social Credit Party. The Social Credit Party would go on to win almost 200,000 more votes than what they received in 1949. Taking advantage of the new ranked voting system, Social Credit and Cooperative Federation voters marked these two parties as their first two preferences. In the end, Social Credit won 19 seats and the Cooperative Movement won 18. Meanwhile, the coalition of Liberals and Tories collapsed. Between both parties, only 10 seats were won. The victory surprised the Social Credit Party and they did not have a leader to bring them into power. The party elected in a haste W. A. C. Bennett, a former Tory who had lost out in that party's leadership contest. Bennett had only been a member of the social credit movement since the previous December. In order to strengthen his mandate, he intentionally lost a no-confidence vote and called for another election in 1953. In that election, Social Credit won 28 seats in the legislature and would have enough to have an all-out majority in the government. Being a former Tory, Bennett would do what the Alberta Social Credit Party did and that would to reject whatever founding principles the party latched onto. From 1953 onward, Social Credit would be effectively a populist conservative party. Social Credit would also serve as a means for both liberals and conservatives to check the rise of the Cooperative Federation and ensure that it would never take power in British Columbia. Despite being a conservative, Bennett made the British Columbia Social Credit the largest and most powerful social credit provincial party in Canada. Though it would never eclipse the, quote, big blue machine of Ontario, British Columbian social credit would become a means for politicians to rise in their respective political careers. The British Columbian Social Credit Party would continue to win election after election in the province and would become so powerful that it even cut off all ties to the Federal Social Credit Party by 1971. Throughout the course of social credit governments, there were attempts to nationalize certain industries such as the nationalization of the hydraulic system in the 1960s. Despite this, the party remained firmly conservative in its outlook. The party would continue to dominate politics till in 1972 when it unexpectedly lost in a landslide to the New Democratic Party, the successor to the cooperative movement. The election defeat was attributed to a series of gaffes on the part of Bennett and the Social Credit Party. Members of his cabinet had gone as far to suggest that after 20 years of running the province, the party had become complacent. Bennett and Social Credit would lose the election, and W.A.C. Bennett would retire from politics. However, it wouldn't be the end of the Social Credit Party, nor would it be the end of the Bennett family. In the 1975 British Columbia elections, Bill Bennett, son of W.A.C., would lead the party back to power. 
Bennett was able to bring together liberals and conservatives in an alliance against the hard left and ousted the new Democratic Party from power. As a result, the party would come to once again dominate all areas of the province outside of Vancouver. The election win was remarkable as a turnaround. The Social Credit Party won 35 seats in the, le in the legislature, while the NDP won only 18 seats. Under Bennett's leadership, the party moved even further to the right and once again became a Big Ten party for all non-socialist voters. Bill Bennett retired from political life in 1986, and Bill van der Zlom replaced him as the leader of the Social Credit Party. Under his leadership, the party would go much more in a conservative direction, especially when it came to social and cultural issues. In response, some would-be liberal voters began to feel put off by the party and defected. This would end up hurting the party in the long run and would usher in its decline. Zalem was something of a divisive figure within even his own party. He was forced to resign in 1991 due to a conflict of interest scandal surrounding a theme park he owned and then it was replaced by Rita Johnson, Canada's first provincial female premier. In a subsequent leadership battle against Grace McCarthy, Johnson won narrowly but was unable to carry much ground. The unity of the party suffered as a result, and going into the 1991 elections, there was little hope of an election win. Going into the election, Johnson tried unsuccessfully to distance herself from her predecessor. Meanwhile, more moderate voters began to defect in greater numbers to the Liberals. The Liberals had not had any seats in the legislature for 12 years at this point and positioned itself as a moderate choice between the right-wing Social Credit Party and the left-wing NDP. The election proved to not only be a defeat for the Social Credit Party, but a shocking one. The NDP won in a massive landslide, securing 51 seats in the legislature. The Liberals went from having no seats in the legislature to securing 17, making them the official opposition. The Social Credit Party, meanwhile, came in a whopping third, winning just seven seats and suffered a 40 net loss in the number of seats. The Liberals had returned to the opposition. In the aftermath, the Social Credit Party never recovered. More moderates fled the party while McCarthy was elected leader. She was not able to enter the legislature till February of 1996, where she ended up losing in a bitter by-election in a once Social Credit stronghold called Matsky. Her defeat was more or less the final nail in the coffin for the party. By the 1996 election, all remaining incumbents of the party had resigned, leaving the party with zero seats going into the election. Observers noticed just how badly the once dominant party had crashed and burned in such a remarkably short amount of time. In 2001, the party did manage to nominate two candidates for the entire province, and both were soundly defeated. From there, the gradual disappearance was not only sudden, but eerie. The party had existed in name only by 2001, and in 2005, only small and minor updates were made to the website, and in 2012, it was completely archived. In 2013, the party was officially deregistered in accordance to British Columbian law. In 2016, the party was briefly re-registered. There was a brief revival to bring back the party in 2017, but to no avail. And in 2020, the party fielded no candidates. And that is the story of the British Columbian Social Credit Party, a once strong and promising political party that had brought many would-be politicians of both liberal and conservative stride into politics, but ultimately became complacent and could no longer serve the needs of the people. And I hope you enjoyed this documentary today. 
please make sure to like and subscribe as we will talk about more political parties that had once dominated till their sudden defeats. Thank you.